Hey guys, welcome to another episode of the Block Thrasher Daily Crypto Update, where we are simplifying crypto by shattering the complexities with news, commentary, analysis, and education. It's Tuesday, April 27th, 9.16 a.m. I am running a little late today. Just got up a little bit later. I think I needed it. My body needed that. Been working so hard of late. And you know, you just hit that wall sometimes, right? And that's what happened in my case. So apologize for dropping this a little bit later, the pod, but hey, got to do it sometimes. It's a beautiful day though. Tuesday, the sun is shining here in the uh, beautiful state of Oregon. Going to be leaving Oregon here in the next couple of days, heading down to Texas. Wow. It's going to be a big change in weather, I, I'm sure, because I'm hearing there's 90 degree temperatures down there. Lots of humidity, of course, as always. Whereas here, it's 40 cool and crisp. So <laughs> I got to prepare myself for that a little bit. Let's jump into the market and see what's happening today. Market cap has risen by 4.3%. So we're, we're getting close back to where we were just, just a couple of weeks ago when we were hitting the high in terms of the market cap. Right now, it's at 2.148 trillion dollars. Yes, looking good. Bitcoin dominance continues to drop. We are now at 47.8%, according to CoinGecko.com. And Ethereum continues to rise. It is at 14.2%. That could be because Ethereum is up 21.1%. On the week and up 6% in the last 24 hours. We've got some good news for Ethereum, which we're going to look at in just a bit. Gas prices are rising a bit, though, from yesterday at 92 GUE, which is still relatively low considering what they've been in recent weeks, of course. All right, let's just look at prices really quickly. What's happening with Bitcoin? Bitcoin is still down on the week, 1.4%, but is now rising. It is up 2.9% in the last 24 hours. Bitcoin is currently. $54,958.76. Ethereum, as I previously mentioned, up 21.1% on the week, up 6.2% in the last 24 hours. It is now $2,633.33, which is very close to the all-time high. Things looking good for Ethereum, and it could have something to do with the news that we're going to look at here in just a moment. Binance coin, also in the news today is Binance. God, man, Binance is just killing it, shaking it up, doing good things. It's, yeah, so we'll take a look at that in just a bit, but it is up 12.8% on the week, up 5.8% in the last 24 hours. XRP also pumping up 12.8% in the last 24. It is now trading at $1.39. Cardano seeing a good week up. 8%, 7% in the last 24. It is now trading at $1.31. Dogecoin, Dogecoin took a hit this week, down 33.9%. You know, I think we'll stop right there and come back to the prices and just jump into what I want to talk about with Dogecoin and also our word of the day. There's a lot of mump simus, mump simus out there. Mump simus, what is mump simus? Mump simus is a person who persists in a mistaken expression or practice as opposed to sumpsimus. Mumpsimus and sumpsimus. How do you like those? <laughs> Good words. Mumpsimus, M-U-M-P-S-I-M-U-S. And I can't help but think of our good buddy, Mark Cuban, who continues to promulgate mumpsimus. Who persists in a mistaken expression or practice? Hey, that's my opinion. But this is what Cuban said. Dogecoin is better than any lottery tickets. Okay, I'll give him that. Dogecoin, fun, great for speculation, as is a lottery ticket. But what do we know about lottery tickets? <laughs> you usually lose. Almost always lose. Very rarely do you win. And what does lottery do? What does lottery do? Lottery takes money from the poor, generally speaking, to finance and fund operations of the government, right? Depending on what state you're in and how the lottery works, where you are and whatnot. Speaking on the Ellen DeGeneres show today, billionaire entrepreneur Mark Cuban has explained why Doge seems like a good thing, seems like a good thing to him. Also touching on Bitcoin and Ethereum. 
It's so funny how these articles are written to. And, you know, even if you just like if you carefully listen to what Cuban is saying. You will quickly realize, especially if you go find some of his interviews with people where it's not just a tweet or a soundbite or somebody grabbing like a statement that he made and writing an article around it like this article is doing, which I think is a which is also, by the way, a garbage article from you dot today. But what you will quickly realize if you look into it a little bit deeper is that Cuban believes in Ethereum and he's on board with Bitcoin now and he's on board with NFTs. But this whole Dogecoin thing is for fun. And it's not something he's going to say, but he's accepting it for Mavericks. He's using it to his advantage and to his benefit for the PR. He's using Bit. No, it's not BitConnect. What is it called? Bit. Oh, I'm blanking on it. We'll see it here in the in the um, in the article. Uh, I'm just blinking on it a bit. Ah, it's an app. It's a it's a it's a it's that allows. It's a service that allows for merchants to receive payment. They don't just accept Dogecoin though. They accept a bunch of cryptocurrencies. So this whole thing, are like, oh yeah, we need to accept. It's not like they're solely you you know accepting. Dogecoin for Mavericks merchandise. They're accepting all the cryptos. Anyway. Preferring Bitcoin to a banana. Okay, according to Mark Cuban's Monday's, according to his Monday tweet, today he was going to be on Ellen DeGeneres' show to talk about Doge, the famous entrepreneur who as early as last year laughed publicly at Bitcoin, saying that he would rather invest in bananas since they are edible and Bitcoin is not, has become converted to the quote new faith of NFTs and digital currencies, which he used to despise. <laughs> On the show, he told host Ellen DeGeneres that Bitcoin is a digital analog of gold. Ethereum is a digital equivalent of currency, which uh, also shows a little bit his misunderstanding of cryptos. You can't use Ethereum as a currency when you have transaction fees ranging from anywhere from 5 even at $5 a transaction, which is on the low end, you can't use that as a currency. You can't buy something for $2 and pay a $5 transaction fee. All the way up to people are paying 60 70 80 when you're interacting with a smart contract. No. Ethereum is like a global computing system. Right now, what is it good for? NFT, it's good for NFTs that are high, you know, high dollar value items and for DeFi. Right when people are pulling money in and out of liquidity pools and doing all the things that you can do with DeFi, and you have larger sums of money, and you don't care if you're hit with a seventy or eighty dollar or fifty dollar, whatever it is, transaction fee. And then he says that Doge is what does it say here? He told you that Bitcoin is a digital of gold, Ethereum is a digital equivalent of currency, and NFT is a cool digital collectible that kids can carry in their phones and buy and sell as they would physical collectibles. This is interesting. He didn't say that Doge was the digital equivalent of currency because you know what actually doge isn't bad as a currency because it really it has fast block times has it has it's not bad right i mean it's for a long time before most people you know it's funny because I, I heard i heard this guy saying he went to work and this guy said um have you heard about this new coin doge coin and he's like what the doge was started in 2013 it's not a new coin but it's <clears throat> excuse me choking on myself here he he thought it was a new coin. It's not a new coin. Doge was started in 2013, but it's new to him, right? It's new to a lot of people. But but what I was going to try to say is that, historically speaking, yeah, Doge had some utility because what would happen is you need to get some crypto from one exchange to another exchange. <laughs> and the exchanges would charge high fees for withdrawing Bitcoin, right? Four, five, six bucks or whatever, or another coin. And so you would use Dogecoin. But Doge wasn't the only option. You could use Litecoin. You could use Cardano. There's all kinds of cryptos out there that have z almost zero transaction fees, right? Very, very low transaction fees. Anyway, he says here that Dogecoin is better than any lottery ticket. Cuban also told the host about Dogecoin, which he very recently became a big fan of. The billionaire explained that the coin started as a joke back in 2013, and a few months ago, it turned into a real craze and has been going up in price. The rise is mostly thanks to Elon Musk tweets. Mark Cuban shared that he had bought some Doge with his son, Jake. He believes that Dogecoin is good to invest in since people are using this coin actively now and more and more large Western companies are accepting Doge as payment now. 
even if it does not go up in price, anyone can always use Doge to buy stuff at the Maverick store. Get it? Do you get it? Even if does not go up in price, anyone can always use Doge to buy stuff at the Maverick store. So go out and get Doge. And then when it doesn't go, in, go up in price and you decide, just go buy some stuff at my store. See the PR move there? The shop of the NBA Dallas Mavericks owned by Cuban. Anything from tickets to future games to merchandise. The, door ex the store accepts Doge via BitPay. That's it. That's what I couldn't remember. I don't know why. BitPay. But go check out BitPay. It's not just Doge. In April, the crypto transaction operator expects to have 6,000 Doge transactions on the books at the Maverick store, which is really nothing, very little. Doge remains the favorite coin of visionary Tesla and SpaceX CEO Elon Musk. They just make these statements. Okay, so he did say that. Favorite as in fun favorite, not as in investment vehicle. Tesla holds Bitcoin on its balance sheets and accepts it as payment for automobiles. And we're going to be talking about that today as well because there's news about Tesla and it's holding a Bitcoin. Earlier today, Elon Musk tweeted in response to Dave Portnoy's war tweet that Tesla had sold 10% of its Bitcoin to prove Bitcoin's liquidity. But Musk also said that he had not sold any of his Bitcoin. And this is where it got interesting. This is the first time that Musk has revealed that he owns Bitcoin. Will he reveal that he owns Doge? Number one, probably not because he probably doesn't own Doge. And number two, probably not for this very reason. Portnoy is calling, calling him out and saying, look, this dude, you could be guilty of a pump and dump scheme here, right? Because you buy the asset, then with your you know massive celebrity, and obviously everybody thinks Musk is a genius. Well, I mean, he is a genius. So he says, yeah, j hey, get this Bitcoin, get this dope, whatever. Pump it, dump it. Not saying it's happening, but it's a possibility. And this is what Portnoy is po pointing out here as well. So, Mumpsimus. Adherence to or persistence in an erroneous use of language, memorization, practice, belief, etc. Out of a habit of obstinacy as opposed to sumsimus. Mumpsimus. A person who persists in making a mistaken expression or practice. M-U-M-P-S-I-M-U-S. And sumpsimus. S-U-M-P-S-I-M-U-S -S -S means the opposite. Adherence to or persistence in using a strictly correct term, holding to a precise practice, etc. As a rejection of an erroneous, erroneous but more common form. It is also a person who is obstinate or zealous about such strict correctness opposed to mumsimus. This reminds me of this movie. I can't remember what movie it was, but it was a sci-fi movie. It was set in the future and like they would say over and over again, precision of speech, precision of speech, right? Or have you ever had that friend, that Nazi, you know, the grammar Nazi? Like I would say four words or something or and he's like, oh, it's four word, you know, or whatever. Just <clears throat> zealous about strict, being strictly correct about speech, in your language, right? Which is, which we don't just don't do in the American language. We botch it. I know. All right. Polka dot. Polka dot is up 4.5% to $33.80. Uniswap. Uniswap just having a great week up 24.1% on the week, up 9.5% in the last 24 hours. It is currently trading at $38.98, coming in at number nine. Litecoin is in the top 10. Once again, up 5.5% to $254.87. Bitcoin Cash pushed down to number 11, up 4%, 867. Chainlink, Chainlink up 5%, a little over 5% at 3637. VChain having a nice pump in the last 24 hours, recovering some of its gains because it was down 10% on the week, but is now up 128 Back at number 14 in market cap at 21 cents. And Solana, Solana had a great week, up 38.4% on the week. Had a rough day, down 6.4%, but it's coming back in the last hour. It's currently 
sense. And I do believe Solana is one to continue to watch. Stellar up 10% in the last 24 at 50 cents. Theta is up 4% at 11.29 and Filecoin is up 5% at $151. Nothing else really cover here. Going back to the Doge thing though. Doge thing. Instead of some mumpsimus, let's get some sumpsimus on it. Dogecoin is a mania and a bubble says CoinShares CSO. Meltem Demerors, the chief strategy officer at CoinShares referred to the recent fascination about Dogecoin as speculative mania. She also mentioned that her company hasn't touched the Shibu Inu-inspired meme coin as it looks like a bubble. Others who've spoken out against it. Mike Novogratz, founder and CEO. Novogratz, sorry. I think Mike Novogratz, yes. Founder and CEO of Galaxy Digital recently explained the difference between Bitcoin and Dogecoin. He said that even though both... Cryptocurrencies are skyrocketing in price. They are very different in design. Novogratz noted that the primary cryptocurrency is a well-distributed store of value, while Dogecoin's situation is bizarre, to say at least. Obviously, he's probably speaking to the fact that it's not well-distributed, that it's the majority of the supply is held by a few people, and then obviously it's inflationary thing, which we've talked about so many times. Another believer in Bitcoin, Jim Cramer. You know, it's interesting because these guys, I wouldn't consider Novogratz or Cramer actually to be the best crypto analyst right but they're well known and they're famous and so they carry weight and people listen to what they say but anyway kramer compared doge to playing a game mad money's tv host went further saying that purchasing the digital asset is actually gambling i think dogecoin is sport he said a fun game is gambling i don't believe that gambling should be encouraged which is interesting because it sounds similar to what cuban is saying sort of like a lottery ticket right so you have this very, very low odds of actually winning. All right, moving on to some good news today. Here's some more really super positive news. Not so much for adoption, but just for Binance. Binance is, is innovating. You know, I wanted to stop and think about this for just a second. What happens in technology? <clears throat> we see, even if we just look at traditional space, right? Search engines. If you think back historically speaking, way back in the day, what did you have? You had like AltaVista and Fast.com. And you had Yahoo and others, right? And typically they were really not very good. They, they really sucked. And then selling Google comes along and the guys over at Google figured out an algorithm that made search engine, like searches actually work. I remember in the day, it was like, if you wanted to find something on the internet, you had to really phrase the question of what you were searching for or the words just right. <laughs> Otherwise you wouldn't find what you were looking for. And now that's not the case. And so Google's just like dominated, right? And so then social media, social media came along and there was MySpace and man, they just didn't do things right. Eventually who won out? Primarily number one, Facebook. Facebook's like the giant, right? And so because they innovated and they did things that people liked or they did things that were right. So, you know, within the crypto space right now, I feel like we have something similar, similar happening with Binance, which is the largest global exchange, obviously. They're just doing things, though, that are innovative. Like, for instance, we talked just the other day about the fact that they're tokenizing stocks. And they started with Tesla, and now they're adding Microsoft, and they're adding MicroStrategies and some others. Well, now Binance is launching its own NFT marketplace in June. And this is really cool, and it's really great for Binance. Oh, here, another one would be Amazon. Okay, I just I want to finish up this thought. There were a couple other things I didn't finish up as I was thinking about this. With Amazon, Amazon just absolutely, I mean, I don't even have to just explain it. You guys know how it's just dominated retail, the retail world. And and just now buying up things. I mean, they even bought up like Whole Foods. And I mean, you just go on and on and on, right? And so another example of this type of thing would be both the Apple and the Google Play stores, right? The Apple, the Apple, uh, the App Store and the Google Play Store. And so what happens with these companies is that like if you want to create a, an app or a phone, there's a gatekeeper, which is Apple, especially on, on the iPhone, on the Apple platform. You have to comply. And did you know they take 30% of the frick, they take 30% of the revenue. So if you create a Google app and it's a killer app and you, you've got, you know, in-app purchases or your, even if you're processing transactions like membership, just to sign up for the service, 
Apple gets 30%. It's like this huge corporate tax. And then if you don't comply with everything that Apple does, or you somehow cross, you know, whatever with the, you know, you've got you competitive with something they're doing, or you do something that they don't approve, boom, you're out, you're done, you're locked out, right? We've seen that happen. And then it's similar with the Google Play Store, right? Where they have control, not as tight as Apple does. But what I'm saying here is that power gets consolidated technical, technically, technologically speaking, into some of these major corporations. And when it comes to crypto, one of the key concepts behind crypto is this decentralization and this move away from major corporations having too much control or power, whatever. And, and this is the first time, today's the first day I thought of this and I've talked and as I, it's, it's just been, I mean, it's probably just been stewing in the back of my mind, but Binance is moving in the direction to be that Apple of crypto or that Amazon of retail or that, I'm sorry, Apple of apps, right? And cell phones, the iPhone, the Amazon of retail or, you know, the Google of, they're, they're moving in that direction. And, and, and it's, you know, I don't know how I feel. I, I don't think it's necessarily a good thing. And the story just illustrates that just a little bit here. So let's take a look at it real quickly. Crypto exchange Binance is launching its own marketplace for creating and trading non-fungible tokens, NFTs. The launch is scheduled for June. Binance announced Tuesday it added that the platform offers users low fees, high liquidity, and a better user experience. The news comes at a time when the NFT activity is on the dead on the decline. Weekly NFT trading volumes have dropped significantly since their peak in February, according to data compiled by The Block. Weekly users and transactions of NFT platforms have also declined. When asked why launching the NFT platform now, a Binance Smokeman spokesperson told the block that it is a strategic move by the exchange as it believes in the fundamental value and potential of NFT application in the long run. Quote, they said, we aim to build the largest NFT trading platform in the world by leveraging the fastest, cheapest, and most secure NFT solutions powered by Binance blockchain infrastructure and community systems. Listen, here's, okay, some of the problems that's just like right off the bat is this thing's going to be centralized, number one. So it's not going to be a DeFi type of NFT marketplace. Number two, they are going to use this and they may be very successful at it because they, they probably will end up being the world's largest NFT marketplace. If they can capture the market share there, it'll be like a situation like, well, if you're going to do an NFT, you got to do it there. And then there will be fees. And actually, they do talk about that here in this article. So let's just take a look at it a little bit quicker. I mean, a little bit, a little bit more. The spokesperson went on to say that the NFT platform could attract millions of potential NFT collectors in the world since Binance has users in over 180 countries and regions. You know, it's just popped into my mind. I wonder if there's going to be an NFT converter right? like there is now you can convert an ERC 20 token from Ethereum to Binance to the Binance smart chain. Huh? I'll bet there will be, let's say you have an NFT on Ethereum and you're just like tired of the, of the, of the fees of the Ethereum network or whatever, which hopefully get fixed. And we're going to look at an article about that here soon, but you want to just transfer it over to the Binance smart chain. And in order to do it, you want to, you may have to do it in order to get to enter, to sell it in this massive, you know, NFT marketplace that Binance has created. And so you plug that sucker into the NFT converter. It burns the Ethereum NFT, right? Shuts it down, whatever, with code. With this, interacts with the smart contract of, on the Ethereum through the EVM and recreates it on the Binance smart chain. I don't see why that couldn't happen. Seems totally reasonable. All right, here we go. Two features. The Binance NFT platform will offer, offer two main features, premium events and trading. Premium events will allow creators to exhibit and auction off their work on the platform. Here we go. This is what I was talking about. Binance said it would charge 10% fees for these events and 90% of the pro proceeds will go to the creators as profit. And that's just to start out, right? From the get-go, 10%. One of the beautiful, th excuse me. One of the beautiful things about NFTs was that it allowed for artists to sell their goods without 
the intermediaries without the major corporations. I mean, the whole idea being that, you know, a musician can create an album and sell directly to his users through an NFT and retain the rewards of his work. And here we have it already. Now, Apple charges 30% for creators. Finance is already stating that they're going to create 10%, a little better. But still, I mean, will it be worth it? Maybe it will be because otherwise you may not be able to sell that NFT as a creator. And so that 10% just gives you access to that marketplace through the millions of users that Binance has. Okay, so it's good overall. However, will it remain at 10% or will, before you know it, we see 30%, right? Like Apple does. It's a concern. As for the trading feature, the platform will allow creators to mint their NFTs. See this? This is genius. Genius. I'm an artist, which I actually happen to be. Graphic designer. I own a company, emblemgraphics.com, if you want to check it out. Been doing that for 15, 16 years. Prior to working primarily with crypto. Branding for tons and tons of companies. Logos. Created hundreds of logos. So, an artist wants to create an NFT to sell his art. Boom. Go to Binance. Create that NFT. They're going to make, obviously, a very simple user interface. Click of a button. Boom, boom, boom. Got my NFT created. It's on the Binance Smart Chain. Boom. Right to the marketplace. Bada boom, bada bing. Super simple. It's like, watch out Amazon Create Space. This could go into so many areas. It could go into ebooks. It could go into audio. This could go into digital art. I mean, it's, it's really good and exciting stuff. The only thing that gives me... That you know that I'm hesitant on. It gives me apprehend. You know, makes me apprehensive about it. Is that it's Binance? To be quite honest, based out of Malta, formerly China, becoming a behemoth. I'd much prefer to see this sort of thing happening with Bondly, for instance, which most people have never heard of, but is another phenomenal. NFT marketplace that's rising up and they do bond swap and they're, they're chain agnostic and they, they're much more beholding to the ideologies of, of crypto with decentralization or, you know, and <clears throat> so, so we'll, you know, we'll see, we'll see where this goes. We'll see where this goes, but, but this is how it'll happen. You can go to the platform, you can create your NFT and you can enable users to deposit their existing NFTs on the platform for sale or auction. When asked which blockchain-based NFTs will the platform support, the spokesperson told the block that Binance Smart Chain mainly and Ethereum, of course. Well, yeah, they've got to do Ethereum. Currently, at least for the time being, that means users will be able to deposit popular Ethereum-based NFTs, such as CryptoPunks and HashMath. Hash masks, it's two of the most common NFTs at the moment, popular on the platform. Through our development, we might also support blockchain networks such as Tron, Flow, Wax, etc. Said the, said the spokesperson. That would make sense because Wax is also another one of the big NFT platforms right now. Binance said it would charge one percent as the processing fee for the trading feature, and creators or depositors will continuously receive 1% royalty. That's interesting. I wonder how that works. 1% royalty. So that 1%, I guess that would mean that if it continues to sell and trade hands, there'd be that 1% captured by the creator. So that's cool. The NFT platform is now inviting artists and creators for collaborations through its website. Mobile versions of the platform, both iOS and Android, will be available at a later date, said Binance. Earlier this month, Binance also partnered with media publishers, the publisher of Vogue Singapore, to help them build an NFT platform which will be focused on fashion, arts, and music industries. They're doing stuff over there, making stuff happen. All right, let's talk about this Ether upgrade. Ethereum EIP-1559, this Ethereum upgrade. It has now been penciled in for July. Work has begun on the next Ethereum upgrade, which burns fees to target a base fee 
sufficient for the availability availability of 50% capacity known as EIP-1559 or the fee market upgrade. The DevNet is already out, according to Tim Biko, the coordinator of F1, with the live launch expected in just months. Following a devs call, Biko said, we're looking at mid-July for London, and the fork will contain EIPs 1559 and 3198, base fee opcode 3238, iStage pushback. He further provided a fairly detailed roadmap with the next step being a client's freeze. It's not until June that the testnet goes out with devs seemingly giving just one month for the full network live testnet environment. The upgrade then is estimated to go live sometime in mid-July or about three months from now. In addition to the fee burning EIP-1559, which also tangentially changes Ethereum's crypto economics, the devs also proposed a speed up of the difficulty increase. They're talking about the mining difficulty on the proof of work mining to December rather than the previously planned Q2 of 2022. He said, given what we want to either ship, given that we want to either ship Shanghai and or the merge this year, we agreed we should make the bomb go off sooner as a forcing function. Everyone on the call agreed on aiming for December, Pico said. Devs are already working on prototypes for the merger, that is Ethereum's full transition to proof of stake, removing proof of work miners from consensus. This could get to be a little bit contentious. We will see. Miners aren't going to be particularly happy about that. For this to be ready by December, however, you'd think a full-on testnet would be needed by September to give plenty of time for testing. Yeah, seems like. Devs are perhaps thinking they could achieve it since they are proposing this pullback of the difficulty bomb, which increases mining difficulty to the point eventually one can't POW mine F any more. All right, so here's some of the good things that we can look forward to that are positive for Ethereum holders. In the next couple of months, Ethereans can look forward to the upgrade that burns about 15,000 ETH a day. So, so that's positive because one of the concerns with Ethereum has been that it's inflationary. And there's even question as to total supply and how you can prove it and stuff like that. But, but they're burning 15,000 ETH a day, which is worth 40 million. So taking them out of the total supply. And after that, they can look forward to an 80% reduction in block rewards as miners no longer receive theirs. Once the merger to POS occurs, perhaps later this year or in early 2022. Yeah, at that point, the miners will just quit mining because it, it won't be profitable. It'll cost more in electricity than what they're earning at current prices. I mean, unless the price just goes insanely high. Something that will make Ethereum a lot more scarce than it has been. And until the next Bitcoin happening, it will have lower inflation once the merger goes through while practically having negative inflation if you account for the burned fees. So essentially negative inflation, which which could be good, at least in, for the price, right? Whether this is going to solve transaction speed and fees issues, we'll, uh, we'll see. Whether this even happens is kind of a we'll see thing. I mean, I... I do believe it will, but boy, has it been a long time coming and it could be delayed. I would not be surprised once again. Facebook may, oh, there's a garbage article, but I just thought we'd talk about it because there's a couple of other things in here that are interesting and I think that you should know about. Facebook may reveal holding Bitcoin tomorrow. This is unconfirmed. <laughs> Several major crypto community members are discussing the rumor that Facebook, the social media giant, might be holding Bitcoin on its balance sheet. Among these influencers are Jason Williams, partner of Morgan Creek Digital, British entrepreneur and investor Alistair Mil Milne, and Mira Cristanto, senior research analyst at Masari. All right, those, these, are, these are not, you know, fly-by-night people. These are people with some credibility here. <coughs> the latter has assumed that the current rise of Bitcoin back above the 53,000 level may be due to Facebook buying Bitcoin whereas the recent plunge below 48,000 was due to Tesla selling 10% of its Bitcoin holdings. So that, so yeah, so that was interesting. Tesla, you know, I had speculated that Tesla wasn't going to sell their 
their crypto because they were holding it as a hedge against inflation. Now, here's the thing. There was a story. Were we going to get into the story? Oh, yeah. All right. Well, should we just, uh, shall I merge these two together? I think I will do that here. Looking at this other story, here's what happened here. Tesla, quote, tests liquidity and sells 272 million of Bitcoin. So just to summarize all this up, basically, instead of reading through this, I'm just going to tell you what's going on here that is of interest. Either, either Musk, you know, is is pumping and dumping, and that's genius because he made the Tesla made over a hundred million dollars on this trade by buying Bitcoin earlier on and 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 now selling it. So either they're doing that, which is not, you know, that's smart business. Hey, he made a hundred million bucks trading Bitcoin. Good for him. Or what this, what is, what he's stating is that they did this to test liquidity and this is genius. And here's the reason why. One of the number one reasons that big companies and corporations like Tesla have not put Bitcoin on their balance sheet was because they said it's not liquid enough. So if we need to sell in order to rebalance our balance sheet or for cash flow purposes or whatever the per reason might be, we won't be able to do it. But Tesla just proved Bitcoin is liquid enough. The market is matured enough and they were able to do that. They were able to sell $272 million worth of Bitcoin. If that's the purpose behind this, then it's also genius because what it does is it shows all of these other companies out there that might be considering putting Bitcoin on their balance sheet that it is liquid and that that objection no longer applies. And that's what essentially this, um, what was her name? Me, uh, uh, What was her name? Well, I'm blanking on her name, but that was her hypothesis, essentially, of, um, and we won't jump into that one either. Going back to the Facebook story. Facebook is busy preparing to launch its Diem stablecoin. Facebook's holding Bitcoin would sound logical since the company is taking its second global attempt to enter the cryptocurrency space. The first was Libra stablecoin tied to a basket of leading fiat currencies and now with Diem, a US pegged cryptocurrency. I'm sorry, a US pegged currency. It wouldn't really be well, whether it ends up being a cryptocurrency or not, obviously it's going to just be a stablecoin. This so the question begs the question: Why? There's numerous stablecoins. Why? Why? Why would Facebook not just adopt a stablecoin? Well, because power, control, right? As reported by you today previously, the Diem Association is now in the process of securing a payments license from regulators in Switzerland and plans plans to roll out Diem trials later this year. Libra was unsuccessful since it faced strong resistance from lawmakers and central banks all over the world who feared that the stablecoin from Facebook would disrupt financial and payment systems around the world. Pena also became worried about that and tripled its efforts to test the digital yuan. Yeah, overnight, Facebook could become the largest, the world's largest bank, essentially. And a fiat, which is what this would be, Essentially, although they're saying it will be pegged to the U.S. dollar now. But a fiat digital currency, and it's not going to be a central bank digital currency, it's going to be a Facebook digital currency, is a scary concept. It's a scary thought. Too much power. Too much centralization. No bueno. Cardano developer, IOHK, moving on to a story about Cardano today. And we're almost right here, ready to wrap this up here. We're going to look at a story about Cardano and then one about PayPal. 
and we will be done. Cardano developer IOHK has announced a new partnership with the government of Ethiopia that is focused on digitalizing the country's education system. This is cool. According to a press release shared with you today, the Atala Prism Identity Solution, that's Cardano's identity solution, it's called Atala Prism, will be used for recording and monitoring the grades of 5 million local students across 3,500 schools. The main aim of the initiative is to reduce bogus university applications and make it possible to check the validity of the students' grades without relying on the assistance of third parties. Bringing more transparency to the grading process could increase social mobility and improve employment opportunities for rural Ethiopians. IOHK's John O'Connor claims that Cardano is now mature enough to serve an entire nation. Ethiopia's blockchain-based education transformation is a key milestone on IOHK's mission to provide economic identities and employment, social and financial services for the digitally excluded. After five years of R&D, Cardano is now mature enough to underpin a blockchain solution which can scale to serve an entire national population. And, and this is one of the things that attracted me to Cardano and that I like about it is the big picture ideas that Hoskinson's has to help people around the world, especially in disadvantaged places and in third world countries such as Ethiopia to solve real world problems problems kind of not caring about price or trading etc but let's go find a real problem out there and help these people with here currently the education system being able to prevent fraud in terms of grades and things like that but also give these people identities and it's it's a brilliant stepping stone then now you've got this wallet you can transact you can do business you can receive small micro payments that you know relative to their economics of the region in which they're in you know for here for the u.s we, we may not need those really small bounce payments for services and goods etc but you can do it there with the cardano thing so good stuff good stuff all right here's some really great news for adoption Demand for PayPal's crypto services torches expectations, says CEO Dan Shulman. PayPal president and CEO Dan Shulman is revealing that demand for the online payment firm's crypto services has significantly exceeded projections. Sweet. <laughs> no surprise to me. In an interview with Time Magazine, Shulman reveals that the payments giant has been looking at cryptocurrencies since 2015, but the company didn't pull the trigger until late last year. Why? He says this. Demand on the crypto side has been multiple fold to what we initially expected. There's a lot of excitement. We've been looking at digital forms of currency and DLT, which is distributed ledger technology, for six years or so, but... I thought it was early and I thought the cryptocurrencies at the time were much more assets than they were currency. Although cryptocurrencies were already under PayPal's radar for over half a decade, Shulman says the technology in the market needed time to mature before the payments giant could take the leap. He said this, quote, they were too volatile to be a viable currency and it was still a little bit too much of people not really understanding what they were going to get into. And what we were really wanting to do is make sure that it became a little bit more mainstream so that we would work hand in hand with regulators before putting anything out into the market. The PayPal chief also says that trends in the financial system point to the decline of cash and the rise of digital currencies. According to Shulman, the shift will facilitate a massive transformation in the current financial infrastructure. It, quote, he says, in the next five to 10 years, you're going to see more change in the financial system than you have over the past 10 to 20 years. How do we think about modernizing the existing financial infrastructure? It needs modernization because it's inefficient today. If you can cash a check, it can take three days for you to get your money. If you do an international remittance, it can take seven days to get your money. And with crypto, 
it's nearly almost instant, depending on the platform which you use. Good, good, good stuff. All right, moving on to our crypto terminology. We're just going to wrap up the eyes today or wrap up this episode with the eyes and talk about some crypto cryptocurrency terminology to help us get better educated and better understand the space. Immutable. Immutable is a property that defines the inability to be changed, especially over time. So we talk about one of the cre- one of the core principles, technological principles or capabilities, features, you would say, of Bitcoin and of the blockchain that gives it value is its immutability. So that means that once a transaction is recorded on the blockchain, it can't be removed. It can't be deleted. It can't be moved in time. Like with a regular database, right? You can delete a record. You can move it. You can shift it to a different place in time. But blockchain is this real-time chronological database that's being created where entries are being entered. And the entry that is entered now is connected to the entry that was entered previously. And the, and the, and the future entries that are put into the database will be connected to the entries that preceded it. And that's why it's called a chain. And so it's immutable. And if you were to yank a piece out, what happens if you yank a piece out of a chain? You break the chain, right? And it terminates that chain. Now you might be able to continue on with the chain that was removed or attach another chain to it and have, that's what we call a fork. Think of like a real world metal chain and it can split off and it can go in two directions. And then people can argue, which one's the original chain? It can be hard to tell sometimes. <laughs> but that's why it's called immutable. And this has, this brings value to the technology, to the chain. Because you, it brings certainty and it brings reliability and trustability. Like you can trust that the transactions that have occurred, once they've been entered and recorded onto the blockchain, aren't going to be changed. They're going to stay there. Nobody's going to go back and fiddle with or mess with. And it's all done cryptographically as well. You see? And this is one of the beautiful things. This is one of the genius creations of blockchain that has given Bitcoin and the rest of the cryptos that utilize the technology so much value. Impermanent loss. What is impermanent loss? Impermanent loss is when a liquidity provider has a temporary loss of funds because of volatility in a trading pair. It's a big, uh uh-oh, we don't have the funds to give you what we promised in terms of interest earned when you're providing liquidity in DeFi and permanent loss. Infinite approval, pre-approving smart contracts to enable the platform to spend any amount of your coins. Yeah, that doesn't seem too smart, does it? All right, inflation. What is inflation? Well, I'll tell you what, we're going to give a very simple definition here, but this could be argued and argued and argued and argued. Inflation, though, is a general increase in prices and fall in the purchasing value of money. And that's not a bad description. And so what happens is within our fiat-based central bank, we're talking Federal Reserve U.S. backed system, the money supply is constantly increasing. And so it's an inflationary system. And now the Federal Reserve has come out and said that they want to create an even more inflationary environment. They do not care because they have this belief. See, it's based in Keynesian economics, which is, we're talking John Maynard Keynes here, the British economist who stands in opposition to the Austrian economists like Ludwig van Mises or Rothbard. Who believe in a real money, a hard money. Now, many people don't know, but cryptocurrency, Bitcoin and the others, were really born out of this Austro-economic, this Austrian economic school of thought that believed in hard money, which you know traditionally was gold, which we were on for a long, long time. And here's the interesting thing about inflation. If you go back and you look at when we were on the gold standard from like 1800 uh, up until, you know, the creation of the Federal Reserve was in 1988, 19... 1913 uh, is when my mind was wanting to say 1918, but I believe it was 1913. 
creation of the Federal Reserve, same time they create, same time they created the uh, income tax. But where I was going with that, uh, we were on, we were still on the gold standard up until 1971, 72, uh, internationally speaking. But in in 1933, they pulled us off the gold standard. 1933 under Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Point being, though, is if you look at at what what happened monetarily speaking prior to that, from the 1800s up to till 1933-ish, the prices of goods dropped over time because there was a hard money, a real money, a, a gold-based money. So you couldn't inflate the money supply. You couldn't create money. It was restrained. So as the amount of goods and services increased through production, through the industrial industrial revolution, right? And uh, the increase uh, in population and living standards and people's dollar bought more stuff. And it was a good thing. It wasn't a bad thing. So you enter into the Keynesians who have this other philosophy that, you know, we need to constantly create money velocity by inflating expanding the money supply which thereby forces people to spend that's the thought behind it see here break it down really simple for you if you have a thousand dollars and today it will buy a certain amount of chocolate let's say who i don't know i know you're not going to need a thousand dollars of chocolate i should have found something that you're going to need a thousand dollars but let's just say chocolate for the sake of argument if you know that in two months, the price of chocolate is going to go up 20 cents a bar and you're going to need more dollars to buy the same amount of chocolate, are you going to wait two months to buy the chocolate? No, you're going to buy it now. You see, that's the point of it. Spend it now. Don't save. Don't store it. Don't hold it. You either have to spend it or you have to invest it in something that's going to keep up with inflation, right? Right? Man, I just got off onto a rabbit trail here. So this is what happens. Inflation isn't things becoming worth more. Gas isn't becoming more valuable. Gold isn't becoming more valuable. Food isn't becoming, wood isn't becoming. Now there are supply and demand issues that can that can affect the price of a commodity or an asset within a, within a market. But these things continue to rise in price, not because they because production is down, not because they're more difficult to make, not because their de- their supply is dropping and the demand is increasing, generally speaking, okay, when we're simplifying this all down. Prices go up because there's more dollars chasing those same goods and services. There's more money going after it. And where this really happens, here's the crazy thing about it. In our system right now, the only way to stem inflation, the only method that the government and the Federal Reserve has to actually slow down inflation is to tax you, is to tax us. Now, I say the only, there is, there are some mechanisms where they can kind of pull some money out of the money supply through the banking system, but it generally doesn't happen. They tax you. That's why taxes exist. You ask the question, how can the government send out these stimulus checks all the time? How can they do the PPE plans and all this stuff and give money, 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 money? Why do they need a tax? Why are they taxing us? Wouldn't it make more sense to just not get taxed? Like, wouldn't you rather that instead of getting a $1,200 stimulus check or whatever you get, wouldn't you rather just not have to pay any taxes at the end of the year? Wouldn't that make sense? But no, because what's happening is it's all so convoluted and sneaky as you feel great. Oh, I got this check. I got this money from the government. This is so nice. They, They care about me. They love me. What a great government we have. And then you have to pay the tax bill later on, or someone does, right? And and that gets way more complicated because there's redistribution of wealth going on and other things that we could talk about. But that's not where I'm trying to go. I'm trying to keep this. This, this is a conversation on inflation that just got sparked by looking at the definition of this word and just thoughts that I wanted to share with you guys that maybe I haven't shared. But here's what, what I was really, where I was going and I got a little bit sidetracked was they do everything they can to keep the inflation down minimum, you know, at, at a point where we as, as pop as a population of people aren't going to just freak out because we go to the gas station and have to pay $20 for gas, let's say right now, or, you know, a hundred dollars for a steak or whatever prices that are just like, we can't do this. Right. And, and we just, 
that was not that's not politically tenable. So what happens with a lot of the money that gets created? The massive because because this last year, the MTO money supply increased by twenty five percent, which is which is huge. And, and and recent reports on real inflation are about seven percent month on month. So we're seeing a lot of inflation and we're seeing a lot of money come into the system. Where's that money going? Generally speaking, where has that money been going? This has been happening. This this, this massive increase in the money supply has been happening since QE started, like way back under. George Bush in 2008, 2009, after the great financial crisis, most of that money has been going into the stock market. So if you go look at a chart of the stock market, it's been up, 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 up. Now there's some dips here and there, but primarily speaking, we've had this phenomenally, you know, unusually long bull run market, right? Why is this happening? Because all this new money that's created is being pumped into primarily into assets and into the stock market. That's where it's going. And that doesn't cause inflation per se as bad as if that money was going. It's not as inflationary, like real painful type of inflationary for the average person. It's just making the wealthy wealthy. It's just making the corporations wealthy. It's just making the people that actually have large holdings in the stock market wealthier in terms of you know nominal dollars that they have. But when they do the stimulus and that money goes directly to the people, which, you know, if you were to look at all the QE and all the bailouts and all the money that's been out, they could they could literally have sent every United States citizen somewhere between 50000 to a hundred, like to, a, you know, a million dollars if you run the numbers, right? Run the numbers. The amount of debt we have that, you know, again, that, another point. We're at, what, what are we at? 35, 35 trillion? 40 trillion? I don't know. It keeps going up because they keep, they keep doing stimulus of 4 trillion, 2 trillion, 3, whatever. Right, which is like reckless abandon. I mean, there was a time where we used to talk about like, oh crap, we've got a three trillion dollar debt, a true four or five trillion dollar deficit, whatever. Now it's a, it's just insane. But when they send that money out to regular people, and it doesn't end up going into the banks or into the to the into this into Wall Street into the stock market, you see real inflation really kick in, and we're seeing that with the prices of wood and the prices of gas and the prices of food and all over the place. Anyway, enough about inflation. Initial bounty offering, IBO. It is a novel way of launching a project that focuses on people contributing skills to a platform rather than money. An initial coin offering, an ICO, and we saw this really happen in 2017, which then led to the crypto crash of 2017 when China banned ICOs and... There was a lot of fear and uncertainty and doubt in the U.S. that the same would happen. And there were some threats where there were some notices given and there were some companies that received, uh, you know, notice from the SEC. An initial coin offering is short, an ICO, short for initial coin offering, is a type of crowdfunding or crowd sale using cryptocurrency as a means of raising capital for early stage companies. An initial DEX offering, an initial DEX offering is an alternative to an initial coin offering or ICO. Initial exchange offering, a type of crowdfunding where crypto startups generate capital by listing through an exchange. And we've seen a lot of those on Binance and other exchanges. Initial token offering, an ITO. Initial token offerings are similar to initial coin offerings, but have more of a focus on offering tokens with intrinsic utility in the form of software or usage in an ecosystem. Instamine, when a large portion of a coin's total supply is distributed to investors shortly after launch. Intermediary or middleman, a person or entity that acts as the go-between between different parties to bring about agreements or carry out directives. Internet of Things. Internet of Things, also known as IoT, is a global interconnected network of devices, sensors, and software that can collect and exchange data with each other in real time over the internet. Okay, friends, thank you so much for your time today. As always, I appreciate you. Please be sure to go to blockthrasher.com and just sign up for an account there. You'll be, you'll be automatically added to the newsletter, which I will be producing here shortly, a weekly newsletter that will give updates about what's happening in the market, but also highlight coins that I believe you should pay attention to as well as other things. So visit that blockdirector.com. Please be sure to subscribe. 
If you're watching on YouTube, hit that subscribe button and the like button, share, and on the podcast, the same thing. It's been exciting. It's been really exciting and fun to watch the audience grow, actually, uh, especially on the podcast. And it's incredible to watch. I was just going to pull that up right now and see if I could get some of the data, except for my internet is proving to be slow here about listeners. 80% of our listeners are in the United States, but we also have listeners in Canada, which is a large percentage at 4%. We've got Belgium, United Kingdom, Australia, South Africa, Norway, Ivory Coast, Netherlands, Sweden, France, New Zealand, Italy, Switzerland, Russia, Mexico, the Czech Republic, Hong Kong, Ireland, Chile, Spain, Romania, Puerto Rico, Germany, Argentina, Austria, Slovenia, South Korea, Japan, Denmark, Malta, Brazil, Philippines, Kuwait, Lebanon, United Arab Emirates, Singapore, Hungary, India, Israel, Estonia, Ghana, Poland, Ecuador, Kenya, New Guinea, Gabon, Thailand, Portugal, Antigua, and Barbuda, and Dominica. To all of you, thank you for listening. For those of you outside of the United States, it's great to have you with us listening to the Block Thresher daily updates. Right now, our largest audience is on Apple Podcasts at close to 60%. Spotify comes in after that. Then Podcast Addict, Anchor, and others. We've been on the Apple podcast platform for a long time, but we've just become an official Apple podcast, listed Apple podcast, which I think also might be helping drive some numbers to the show. So listen, if you uh, wouldn't mind, I would just be very thankful and grateful to you if you would leave a review, especially on the Apple podcast platform, give us five stars and uh, leave a bit of a review so that we can continue to grow this audience as I just work as hard as I possibly can and make every effort to bring value to you guys every single day. Appreciate and love you all. I look forward to talking with you tomorrow. Have a great, great Tuesday. Press on. Remember, it's always a good time to earn more crypto and to stack. See you now. Bye.